Hi everyone. Hi. Um, thanks for coming. Uh, just so you know, we are, are videotaping the session and now it's going to go up on YouTube and if you really object to being in the audience on a videotape thing, probably shouldn't. Um, today's seminar is our, a new, new doctor. Right. <laughs> so um, Annie Wally, who's uh, who spoke to us uh, last year as well, and has been in the division of epidemiology and biostatistics for a while. And today he's going to talk to us about quantile regression, a simple approach to complex problems. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Maya. Good afternoon to everybody. And uh, okay, as Maya was saying, the objective of this session is to present. Uh, an overview of quantile regression. You know, the, the seminar, the idea uh, behind this seminar, this seminar series is that uh, is to present a general idea to uh, invite people to, to go further. So the objective is not to go in the detail, statistical detail, but to present a practical application, reason why this technique, in this, in this case, quantile regression could be helpful depending on your research question or your uh, specific problem. The, um, the outline of this presentation is quite simple. We start with a motivation example, which is the relationship between smoking and obesity in South Africa. There is a disclaimer at this point because I'm using real data, I'm doing real analysis, but for the uh, purpose of this seminar, the model. So please don't take the results as the real result of the South African population. They are not so different, but we really need to do other stuff to use a more complex model to take into account other confounders. Um, then we go, after the motivation example, we go to present uh, the basis, the idea behind uh, quantile regression, and uh, we will use uh, as a reference uh, the linear regression method that everybody knows. So I'll try to present this in terms of similarity and difference with the linear regression in general, generalized linear model. And then we go to, to have a look at how practically we can estimate a regression model with some examples and uh, indication of software we can use, which is quite quick to do. And then in the last part, okay, we do a summary. We try to identify some uh, uh, pros and cons of using this technique compared to other techniques. Okay, let's start with this example. The motivation example is uh, this. There are two, two basic uh, ideas behind this example. First, there is a quite a large literature that shows that uh, smoking and uh, obesity, BMI, body weight, are related in population. And uh, with some exception in special population, but in general population, normally the result is this, that smokers weigh less than no smoker, and smoking cessation is associated with an increase in BMI or body weight. Mm. The second observation is that the national plan, strategic plan for communicable disease in South Africa, among the objective, uh, presented a, a target of re reducing the prevalence of smoker, smokers by at least 20%. So if, you, if we put it together, these two things we can ask, but how this uh, this reduction in the prevalence of uh, smoker will affect the obesity epidemic. We should expect that uh, we have an increase in number of obese people for the reason if you do nothing else. So this is the basic idea, simplified idea, but realistic because there are lots of studies in other countries that uh, uh, deal with, deal, dealt with this problem. Okay, so first uh, possibility, Let's start to do an analysis in the, what I call the traditional way, no, not especially traditional, but anyway, using linear regression. What we do, we, we are using this sample for the, the last wave of the MIT survey. We're using a sample of women, uh, adult women, and uh, I exclude uh, those with pregnant women, obviously, and also I exclude those with incomplete uh, baby. So it's a full, uh, is a, 
um, complete case analysis. So the first thing we can think is something like that, classical uh, linear regression model. BMI is a linear combination, is given by a linear combination of uh, uh, three variables, the variable of interest that uh, is smoking, a binary variable, and then I put as an example two possible confounders, age as a continuous variable, and alcohol use as a binary variable, yes and no. Then we have a usual uh, intercept and the error there. Everybody knows how to fit this model with uh, Stata, for example. Use the regress command, BMI, smoking age, alcohol, and this. We know data are survey data, so I'm waiting to take into account the sampling scheme of the survey. And we have the result like this. What is interesting for us is this, our, this coefficient the coefficient of smoking, and we interpret as usual as the effect of smoking. We are not going uh, this uh, relating the, the problem, this is a real effect, and mm -hmm. not, but from a physical point of view, is the difference in the mean BMI between those that smoke and those that don't. And uh, taking into account the confounder in this case, the distribution of age and alcohol uh, use that could be different between if it is between smoker and Because uh, we know that the coefficients are, con we know, we pose in this kind of model, coefficients are constant, it's quite easy to show, uh, we don't have to, to do too much to show that if the P0 is the prevalence of smoking in 2014, and P1 is the prevalence of smoking we wanted to achieve after some kind of intervention in the next, next five years, then beta 1 times the difference between P1 and P0 is the expected change in the mean BMI <coughs> in the South African population if we have to achieve a 20% reduction in, uh, in smoking prevalence among women. Let's see, in our case, in our case the result in simple calculation is that we can expect uh, an increase of uh, 0 0.03 kilogram per square meter in the mean BMI of women in South Africa as an effect of the reduction by 20% of the prevalence of smokers. Um, it, this difference is statistically significant. Sorry, I didn't point out before, but yeah, <coughs> statistically significant. Okay, so we know if we, if we convince 20% of women to stop smoking, we could expect a 0 0.03 increase. In this. But this is what we want to achieve <coughs> in our analysis. So the, the, is the problem solved? I have some doubt. And this is the reason why <laughs> we are doing this. <laughs> um, first, there is some doubt, which is a usual problem, doubt about uh, the, the, model, the modeling assumption. What we are assuming here is that uh, the residuals are, uh, uh, or the condition, uh, or the distribution of the outcome conditional to all the covariate are normally distributed, more or less, and are, sorry, what happened? Oh, okay. And if we consider the distribution among smoker and non-smoker, we are hypothesizing something like that. Same distribution, different mean, same variance. So practically we are hypothesizing something like that, that the old distribution will move away, will move to the right because of smoking. Is this reasonable? If you look at the distribution, this is unconditional, it's not the same thing, but just in the sample, we can have some doubts, especially not too much regarding the shape of the distribution, that that's pretty normal. I mean, uh, linear regression is quite robust to deviation from normal. The problem is more about uh, variance that uh, clearly is much higher among smoker than among non-smoker. And also, which 
is interested in this, that what seems is that nothing is happening here, and a lot is happening here. So this is the first problem. Maybe the assumptions are not uh, exactly fulfilled, but I would say this is not uh, the most important problem because uh, in this specific case, this is my opinion, we can discuss this, but just to make it short, my opinion in this case that uh, regarding the estimation of the mean, we won't have uh, severely biased results because of this problem. So probably, let's put this, we, we, we can get a proper estimate of the change in the mean. But the problem is another one. Are we really interested in the mean effect? What I'm saying, I'm saying this for this reason. Look at this graph. This graph, these three graphs represent um, a change in a distribution. Each graph has got two different distributions. The first one, the left one, is always the same. The second one is the second distribution that has a higher mean, but a different shape. And the three distribution, the difference between the mean, between the mean, for example, this and this, and between this and this, and this and this, are the same. So the change in the mean is the same, but everybody understands that uh, from a practical point of view, a point of view of epidemiological point of view, these three things represent a very different uh, effect of our potential intervention. Especially because we know this about uh, the relationship between BMI and many disease. This is relative risk of death. It's a very well-known J-shaped relationship, which is the reason why we divide uh, this way. <laughs> if we put uh, more or less here at 25, uh, uh, the difference between underweight and... <coughs> so what it says is that if someone changes BMI by 1.37 kilogram square meter here, so it was overweight and becomes less overweight, that's good. Is an improvement, is an imp re reduction in the relative risk of death. But if someone that is normal weight, uh, the higher part of normal weight, the change, the same quantity, this is completely different effect. So in our case here, here, our change, the same change in the mean, 137, uh, 1.37 kilogram per square meter, means that uh, we have no effect among underweight people, and we have a harmful effect here. Here we have a beneficial effect for some people, and a harmful effect here. This is the reason why sometimes we need to go beyond the mean. We need to model something else. And there are millions of ways to do this, but today I think what what I'm interested to present is a way to model, rather than a single parameter, to model the change in the whole distribution. Which seems, this is one of the reasons of the title, seems a complex problem, because you say, okay, it's already sometimes complex to model the mean, we want to model the whole distribution. But the practical way to do this is not so complex, even we need a little bit of uh, cautious. Okay, so we're moving from modeling the mean to model, to model the whole distribution. So we are not assuming anymore that the distribution stays the same, but we are assuming we want to relate the whole shape of the distribution to the covariate, a set of covariate. We will use in our example the same as before, smoking, alcohol, and, um, and age. There are many ways we are interested in uh, quantile regression, which is a, the basic idea is quite old, it's two centuries old, but the formal uh, theory, all the description, description of the method we are using today uh, is at the end of the 70s, and there is a
free, we, we, we will uh, speak uh, the problem is computer. Without computer quantile regression, I'm not saying that linear regression, if you have a thousand cases, is easy without a computer, but quantile is almost impossible with a hundred cases. Anyway, quantile regression. So, what's the basic idea? This is our linear model. And because we are assuming that the error, the expectation, the mean of the error is zero, this is the same. We are saying we are modeling the expectation, the mean of the BMI, the population, as a function, linear function, in this case, of uh, our covariate. The idea behind uh, quantile regression is pretty simple. Rather than modeling the mean, we, mo we model the quantile. Quantile are the cut point that divide a distribution in uh, equal parts. For example, the median divides the distribution into parts. If the median BMI of <coughs> South Africa is uh, 26, means that 50% of South Africa have a BMI less than 26. Or the quantile, or the percentile, the 25th percentile, so obviously, is, this is just an example, just to refresh, this is a generic example, this is a BMI, for example, means that 10% of this population, represented here, this is a fake population, has a BMI less than 18, and here means that 95% of population has BMI less than 44. So the idea is this, rather than modeling as a linear function, mm -hmm. as a generic function of a covariate, the mean, we model each of this quantile, we can choose uh, how many quantile we want. So, for example, in our case, what we are saying, put, consider the 25th percentile. This is for smokers, and this is for non-smokers. What we are modeling is this difference. How the 25th percentile change between smokers and non-smokers or in terms of effects, how can I expect the 25th percentile to change if people stop smoking? But the interesting thing um, is that we can do this not only for the 25th, we can do for the 75th, we can do for the 50th, which is called the median. So we can do many times. So if you do the same procedure enough time, we can have a dense, uh, as dense as we want, a distribution of points, so we can model the whole, the change in the whole distribution. This is the, I think, is a very simple idea behind the quantile regression. We model each quantile, uh, because we can choose which quantile we can model, we can model all of them, and the results, we can have an idea of uh, the change in the whole distribution. Obviously, I, I, I'll, I'll start to tell you now because this is not the perfect solution to, for everything. It's obvious that uh, if you want to estimate something here, when you have three people on your sample, it's gonna be quite uh, difficult to have reliable estimates. So obviously this uh, works uh, pretty well with large sample, even a small sample, but obviously if you want to, to estimate uh, extreme percentile in small sample, you're gonna have uh, problems. Anyway, practically, how can we do this? This is what we do in uh, uh, ordinary least square, for the name, we minimize the, the square of the, the sum of the square of the residuals. This is what we do if you want to model. We can prove this. I'm not doing this, but there is a fantastic <laughs> article there. You can read everything. It's not difficult, by the way. Uh, for example, with the mean, we have a very similar formula. The only difference, rather than, than minimize the sum of the square, we minimize the sum of the absolute value of the residuals which seem a small change, but the problem is that when you have to do practically, computationally, it's a disaster. 
it, it used to be a disaster. Now we have more modern algorithms to do this. But this is a problem because the normal procedure don't work because uh, this, uh, this function has got the steps. So it's not, uh, you can't differentiate. So it's very, it's relatively difficult to minimize. If you want to model, this is a more complicated formula, but it's a complex formula, but very similar. If you want to, to minimize any quantile, the type, quant, the tau, quantile tau, we do the same. So practically we minimize the sum of the square absolute uh, diff residuals, but we weight by tau, those less in the left part, by one minus tau, the or the value distribution. But it doesn't matter the formula, we are not doing manually. But the basic idea is pretty simple. Rather than minimizing the sum of the square, we minimize the square, the, the, the sum of the absolute deviation, the absolute residuals. Practically, no, okay, before practically, sorry, I think I swapped this slide. But anyway, why this procedure is interesting? Okay, first, because this procedure doesn't assume any distribution. I told that uh, uh, linear regression is quite robust for deviation from normality, but you can't do it if the distribution is this. It doesn't work. With quantile regression, it's complete. It's not an approximation. It's completely independent. Uh, distribution doesn't matter. As a consequence, it is, it's the same thing from another point of view. Outliers are uh, very, uh, very, very little influence. Uh, there are few, obviously, if there are too many, maybe they are not outlier. But this is an example. This is a linear regression. This is the base. If, you are, if I add this outlier, the regression line changes like that. If you add this, is an extreme outlier. It's a little bit exaggerated, but the regression line changes completely. This is what happened with uh, median regression, nothing changes. This is, is more interesting than uh, <laughs> seems at the beginning because uh, I don't know you, but for me, looking at outliers is a problem because every time you ask, should I eliminate this outlier or is this outlier is telling me something? So it's a big problem if you have a big data set. Um, another Interesting thing, linear if our assumption about normality of uh, constant variance are uh, uh, correct, linear regression, or less, is very efficient. So we have very small standard error. But even with the mean, if our distribution becomes, uh, the tail becomes a little bit uh, uh, higher than they should be, linear regression becomes even if you have the same, not biased result, but uh, you have um, uh, a loss of efficiency. So sometimes, this is another extreme example with a very high uh, heavy tail. Uh, look at the standard error of the mean and the standard error of the median. Again, it's an extreme case, but it shows that even if in general, uh, linear regression in, with the mean, modeling the mean is more efficient. There are cases when the, the distribution has got very heavy tail, when uh, me, modeling the median, even if we are not interested in the whole distribution, modeling the median is more efficient than modeling the mean. So smaller, uh, narrower confidence interval. And then this is something that we share with linear regression. We can we are not really limited to linear relation. We can use polynomial. We can use the same method we use for linear regression can be applied here. How to do practically? This is the good news. All software have a quantile regression fit. R, Stata, SIS, all. And believe it or not, even Excel. This is not, I'm telling you, you should use Excel to do statistical analysis, never. But to have an idea that uh, is widely <laughs> available. So you can do quantile regression with Excel. Go back to our, uh, go back to our example. 
This is how you can fit this model in R. This is the formula, linear, progression. This is this, the quantile I want to estimate. In this case, I, I use a sequence of quantiles, starting with the percentile, starting with the 0 0.15 until 0 0.85 with a step of 0 0.005. So it's a quite a dense uh, uh, sequence of quantiles or percentiles. So we can have uh, a nice uh, representation of the whole distribution. OK, those are data, and this is, again, the weight. You can do the same in theta with this. Theta, this theta commander doesn't allow to put the whole sequence, so you have to repeat with uh, this. But there are other commands. You can uh, make this automatic. But the results are the same. I tried. I didn't believe that this is going to work. OK, let's go. These are the results. Actually, this is a small part of the result because we are, actually we are doing the same estimation for the different quantiles. So the result is a long list of models. This is, for example, the one to the 25th percentile. This is the median, and this is the 75th percentile. But we have the whole series. We are interested in this. And this is the first interesting result. Look at what happened. This is the 25th percentile, so we are in the left tail of the distribution. What happens is that smoking seems to have a strong effect, statistically significant, on uh, BMI. Then we are moving in the center of the distribution, and the coefficient is much smaller, still negative, much smaller, and it's not significant. Then we go in the other tail of the distribution, and we have a coefficient that is a little, is still smaller than this, a little bit higher than this, but not significant. This is, you can see much better this with this graph, I, I think, because this graph represents all our estimates. This is the quantile, so the, our twin, the estimate we were looking before is about here, the median is about here, and the other one are there. And this is the confidence interval. What can we conclude looking at this? That until the fourth percentile, which corresponds in the data, I don't remember exactly, but it's about uh, 24, something like that, we have that uh, the conclusion is that uh, smoking has an effect, strong effect, negative effect. So we expect that people stop smoking and they are underweight, the way weight they put on weight. But this is not true among these people. Yeah, there is still a negative thing, but it, it's all not statistical. So this confirmed the idea from the graph. You remember the graph when uh, the left, the <coughs> right tail, uh, they were almost the same, and the left tail were different. So this is confirmed our analysis. So if you wanted, th this is the, the previous estimate, which by definition is the same across all distribution. So. This was the conclusion from the linear regression analysis. And this could be a conclusion from another one. If you had to achieve the target, you cause an increase in BMI, uh, BMI among underweight and normal weight women, but no significant change among obese people. So this we are, we are, is not likely to produce a very harmful effect among people that are in the left tail of the distribution. And probably a small beneficial effect in, uh, among underweight people. Uh, I want to, in brackets, we, we don't need to, to, to say so to conclude that in any case it's better to reduce the proportion of smoker for many millions of other reasons. But this is on top of this, probably we don't expect such a negative. 
from a public health perspective, if the results are confirmed with a proper model with all confounded, you could say probably could be interesting to think, uh, to offer some support or smoking support for weight control for people that want to smoke in the left tail of the distribution. Um, this, by the way, is pretty similar to the result of a real big study in China. All study in China, I think. <laughs> uh, result reconciled an inverse average effect of smoking on body weight with the absence of any significant effect of obesity. It's the same. So the average changes, but the obesity rate don't really change for this reason. Because I fit the model, uh, this is the, the same graph as before for the other coefficient. Okay, this is intercept as usual, not very interesting, but mm -hmm. look at age. age this graph says that, uh, yes, age, when you get older, your BMI tends to increase, but tend to increase more among people that are already obese or, or overweight. While people that are uh, thin, they tend to keep more, uh, to increase less their body weight. And alcohol, this is another interesting example uh, of what could happen, that uh, there is no effect in the tail, but only effect in the middle of the distribution. I won't interpret this because uh, the, this measure of alcohol use uh, course is just uh, asking a question, have you uh, uh, do you use alcohol? It's quite a vague uh, question, no quantity. But in any case, it's an example of what could happen. This is different from uh, the other two. Um, okay, this is our example. But uh, this is another way to show the result, to summarize the results or a quantile regression. This is the same example for the age. We have age, and this is a, how an estimate of a linear regression on the 90 percentile. And this is 10 percentile, this is the mean and the mean. It's pretty obvious what's going on. The variance is increasing when the distribution is spreading with age. So it's not only the mean that is changing, clearly, Everything is changing, is increasing, but uh, the spread is much uh, higher among older people. Another example from the literature, all related to BMI, is two large systematic review published in reputable journals, same here. One concludes that feeding strongly supports a dose dependent association between longer duration of breastfeeding and decrease in risk of overweight. And they said promotion of breastfeeding, although important for other reasons, is not likely to reduce mean BMI. So, means breastfeeding reduces the risk of obesity in children, but does not reduce the mean BMI. Why? This is a study some years after that, after the two. They analyze a big sample. First, linear regression. Oh, okay, uh, breastfeeding, the predictor is breastfeeding, yes, no. And they measure BMI about, uh, I wrote down, I think, about two years. Uh, linear regression. Regression coefficient slightly negative, not statistically significant. So no change in mean, regardless of breastfeeding or not. Then this is a logistic regression. This is an odd ratio for uh, being overweight at two years according to yes or no breastfeeding. Negative, not statistically significant. And this is another logistic regression a risk of obesity, breastfeeding, and not breastfeeding. And this is statistically significant. So uh, children uh, breastfed, you say children breastfed? Yeah, <laughs> probably. <laughs> uh, children that have been breastfed, uh, they have uh, a 
lower risk, significantly lower risk to be obese at uh, two years. Then they did It's, it's at risk. At risk is of what? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. This is as before the results of a quantile regression, which is, I think, is very interesting because <coughs> look, post low quantile, left tile of the distribution, positive significant effect. Nothing in the middle and the significant negative effect in the right tail. With a graph, it's easy to see what I'm saying. Here and here, we have a higher BMI. So breastfeeding seems to be associated with an increase in body weight among teen children and among children that are already which is in the middle, nothing, nothing happened, not statistics. So the mean is zero, doesn't change, but not because nothing is going on, but because it's called the change in the mean, one direction driven by this is compensated, partly compensated by what happened in the left tail of the distribution. Uh, what are, well, how much time? Oh, okay, good. <laughs> so this is um, another, some practical result we can have using. And this is the, the same study, what, what happened with the quantile. They estimate a few quantiles, and it's pretty clear what's going on. Statistically significant positive, and statistically significant negative, not here in the middle. They, they had a very big sample. They dare to estimate all oh, this quantile one <laughs> and zero. Okay, zero is too much. <laughs> okay. This is another example. I showed just uh, some example from the literature to just uh, to have some indication uh, regarding interpretation. This is uh, about uh, school, effect of school schooling in general, and uh, the connection with, with uh, BMI. High school, among those that uh, have low BMI, if you, if you have high school, you have a uh, higher, uh, higher BMI. But then the effect disappear in people that are already already overweight, uh, obese overweight. I, I don't know exactly, I didn't check which uh, actual BMI corresponds to this. For college, and for some college, college completed, and some college, the relationship is that. So there is a effect in this among people very thin, among people uh, already obese, but there is a much smaller or practically no effect among people in the middle of the distribution. And this is similar, just a, a little bit uh, underway. Okay, we are not going to interpret it according to the study because we need, but the idea is that analyzing this, we can, uh, we can have a better idea of what's going on in the population. Uh, I show this not because uh, you have to read this table. I couldn't get a bigger uh, to copy and we didn't have time. But, uh, I wanted to show this for two reasons. This is a study in economics. If you look on the article about uh, literature about quantile regulation, we find millions of articles in economics. Not only because uh, started the, 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 those that started were economists, but uh, because one thing that uh, quantile regulation is good at is studying problems related to inequality because uh, we, we allow things change, the whole distribution change, so we can study 
what happened, for example, study on poverty. When you study poverty, we are not interested in, in, uh, in the average change of uh, uh, income. We are interested in the change of income among those that are in the left of the distribution of, uh, of the opposite. So when you use uh, a method that uh, just take into account the mean or average value, you conflate the effort of change in the inequality, the distribution, with the effort of change in the actual value. So this is pretty common. And uh, on top of that, another thing that uh, I'm not presenting here, but it's quite interesting, there are a, set, a series of new extensions of quantile regression that allow the same principle to model directly quantity that's very interesting to study inequality. For example, you can model directly the Gini coefficient. So you have a, a, a linear or whatever relationship between the Gini coefficient and a series of covariated directly. Directly means you have confidence interval, you have all this stuff. And there are different other measures of inequality that can be, can be used. This, for example, just for curiosity, this means that uh, they model uh, uh, mortality. It's an ecological study. They, the outcome was mort were mortality rate and uh, lots of uh, coefficient, lots of uh, confounders, but they were interested in the effect of inequality as measured as a Gini coefficient, uh, as a predictor, on mortality rate. And it's interesting to show, I don't have the graph, because economists, uh, they uh, like numbers rather than graphs, <laughs> uh, but uh, increase. So the change in the Gini coefficient seems uh, to, to have a bigger effect among the population when the mortality rate is higher. So that the developing country change in Gini coefficient have a big impact in mortality rate when is, this is not the case in country where the, in any case is smaller there. Okay, this is the last uh, uh, example. This is not, uh, they did the same, but this is another way to present results of uh, uh, quantile regression. I, I'm a little bit insisting in this, but uh, uh, because uh, when you, your output consists of a long list of numbers, if you don't find a way to present this, you get confused, especially you get uh, your readers confused. So this is another way. They, you plot the, in this case, the 90th and the 10th uh, percentile, the same graph, so you can see the, the result this is a different country, and uh, is a, a, again a relation between education, but this with uh, wage inequality. And you can see that uh, excluding Greece, which is always special, in all of the country the effect is much higher in the, in the left tail of the distribution than, than in the right tail. But this is another way. You can use any, any pair of Okay. Yes. Are you taking questions during the talk? Yeah. Is, is that just a QQ plot? Your previous. Yeah. A quantile, quantile. Yeah, but it's only one quantile. Only two. Yeah. There are only two. There's the first and the uh, and you are comparing you are comparing the same uh, distribution but you can use uh, another, i don't have an example but you can use uh, uh, cuckoo plots uh, to compare uh, different the two distribution in uh, i would say this before doing uh, quantile regression because you can have an idea of what's going on in your distribution before adjusting but this is only two quantile not the whole series Okay, summary, and then we can have question or discussion. Pros of the quantile regression. Distribution free, as I told, robust to outlier. And another thing that sometimes could be interesting, it happened to, to transform, for reason of uh, distribution, to transform the, our outcome, which is fine, everything was fine, then you have to interpret 
the results. And the results in the transform variable sometimes are very difficult. If you think you use a square root transformation, everybody teach it. You can do, if you have variable here, you can do square root transformation. And then when you have the results of what you do, what you can interpret. A good thing is that you can transform, provided your transformation doesn't change the order, it's pretty obvious that the result, the coefficient don't change. So you can do, you can use different variable, you can use different transformation for any reason. In this case, not to, to normalize because we are not interested in normalizing, but can be other reason. And you can do and the results are the same. So actually you can do the result in the original and present in another scale. Okay, then I show that is really available, it's exactly the same. It's data, rather than writing regress, you write uh, Q, QR or whatever it's called, and then you have to specify the percentile. Then, as usual, all method, you have lots of uh, other options you can change, but in normal case, you just write this. Comprehensive in the sense that you can have a complete idea. If you estimate many percentiles, you have the whole distribution. Uh, coefficient are easy to interpret. This is one of the reasons why, for example, I, I, I would consider this a little bit more accessible to other techniques. I cited at the beginning the, the model in the location scale shape. There is a long name. GLM. Anyway, this kind of model are interesting. The idea is also simple. Rather than having a normal distribution that is characterized by two parameters, variance and mean, use another distribution, skew normal distribution. You have a mean, you have a skew parameter, and you have a variance, whatever. And you can model each of those parameters. You can use a very flexible distribution if you get a result. The problem is that, look at the simple example, skew normal, you have three parameters. But then, how can you transform in real life a uh, conclusion like that? That use the skew parameter of the, your uh, skew normal distribution change by 0 0.1 for each increase of one year of age. It's quite difficult. It's not in, even, you can interpret easily that uh, becomes more skewed, but how much more difficult? His interpreting uh, quantile is quite uh, easy. I mean, we know what, what a quantile is. This change there, we can graph this change, which is more difficult with other things. In the modeling the shape of the distribution got other advantage, but uh, in this case, uh, we are speaking about this. Uh, problems. This computation, you need a computer. <laughs> I mean, it's not a problem now for normal uh, data sets, it's not a problem. Could be a problem when rather than having the predictor, linear predictor, you start putting other stuff like splines, all this stuff. So, become a little bit more. Uh, we need a, you need a machine, but it's not a big problem now. This is a relatively bigger problem, but similar. There is no closed form for the confidence intervals. So each software apply different approximation, or you can do you can do bootstrap. So you can repeat with different things. Bootstrap is the solution for even sometimes we are not really sure that we are, what we are doing, but you can do. But bootstrap is long because you have to repeat. I said it's not a big problem because we don't have to be scared about the idea about approximation. Because even in, for example, linear regression, the idea is that linear regression, we have a closed form for the confidence interval. So we have precise confidence interval, but this is not true because this is asymptotic. So when we have an infinite sample, but in real life, it's still approximate. So not be problem in modern computer. This means that uh, we have the distribution, but 
we don't have all points of the distribution. We have the point where we estimate the percentile. So we, if you need everything, you need to repeat the same procedure 2,000 times. You want a precise line. This is more a more interesting problem because you is an estimation, so it's not precise. You are an uh, error. It could happen that you estimate one type that cross. So you end up having the 90th quantile that is higher than the 89th. This happens always in the tails because you don't have data. So the solution are two. First, you get more data, <laughs> which is normally is impossible. Uh, second, there are methods. Rather than estimating all uh, equations separately, you, you estimate uh, together a uh, putting constraint. Stata does this, R does this, they are different. Uh, uh, but we need to remember because it happens that uh, you end up with the results, you get lost. No, it's a problem of uh, approximation, it's not perfect. And the last thing, sample size. Sample size doesn't need to be especially higher compared to linear regression, but what is important is sample size in the tails. Obviously. If sample is small, you can still do quantile regression, and we have good result for the median, for whatever, interquantile range, but probably you shouldn't try the tails. If you have a bigger sample, you can extend. This is probably our simplification of this idea. Okay. I think uh, I done. Yeah. Okay, extension. Uh, uh, there are mi millions of extension. <laughs> you can look around. There is a quite active area of research, especially in economics. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>